used wisely. So let's begin. No. All right, good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's meeting. If you have been to our meetings before, you probably know that I am Nicole Ingalls. I'm a planner in the Community Development Division. Um, and tonight we're here to talk about three topics. These are a substantial amendment to the 2019 Consolidated Plan, a couple of changes we have to the Citizen Participation Plan, and our uh, CAPER, the, um, the Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report. And we'll go over a couple of logistics as people are filtering in. You want to go to the next slide? So if you have questions tonight, please use the Q&A box. We will read these questions out loud and respond to them audibly, as well as in the Q&A box where everyone can read them. We have time built in at several points for questions to ask in the chat as we go. Um, so put your questions in and we'll read them out loud and respond when we get to those points. If you have a question that is a clarification question, and needs an immediate response. I'll try to do that in real time. Um, yes, Rosie, your microphone should be on. So our agenda tonight is to go over our logistics, which we're doing now. Then we'll talk about the substantial amendment, changes to the citizen participation, sorry, <laughs> words are fun citizen participation plan, and then we'll have our CAPER presentation. Next slide. First is how to use our interpreters. We have Megan and Sharon providing ASL interpretation tonight, Rosie providing Spanish interpretation, Midge providing real-time captioning. Don't know why it's in this order. Uh, we have Suzanne providing interpretation in Somali, Raymond for Karen, and Shearing for Nepali. I'm going to be speaking slowly and pausing frequently to allow our interpreters to catch up. And um, we are recording all of the different languages so that they can be posted later. If you need to use an interpreter for a language other than English, what you do is look to the bottom of your screen where you should have the interpretation sign that is uh, circled in red in that top image on this slide. When you click it, you'll see the list of languages and you can choose the one that you would like to utilize. If you do that, you should hear me at about 30% volume and your interpreter at full volume. If you do not want to hear me, which is fine, no offense taken, then you can click on mute original audio and then you'll only hear your interpreter. We did a tech check before this meeting and we think that we have all about the kinks that we experienced in the last meeting worked out. But if you are having issues, please let us know and we'll try and help you out. Uh, next slide. We have three important terms to start the night off. You'll hear them repeatedly and we should define them up front. These are the three primary sources of funding that the city receives from HUD to fund projects and programs in the Community Development Division. These are Community Development Block Grants, what we call CDBG, and they can fund some construction type projects as well as public services and economic development activities. Home investment partnerships, referred to as HOME, are geared more towards the production of housing. Finally, ESG, Emergency Solutions Grant, 
is funding that is reserved for homeless service activities. If you'd like to learn more about any of those funding sources, we will be linking to them in the chat right now. One thing that I forgot to mention, and perhaps uh, Marcus put it in the chat already, I did not notice, I'm sorry. Uh, we do have the slides available on our website with presentation notes. So if you'd like to follow along there and have the slides for yourself, they're there. I will also send them out in the morning. Uh, our first topic is the substantial amendment and Alyssa is going to speak to that. Good evening, I'm Alyssa Solachek and I am a city planner for the Omaha Planning Department and I will very briefly talk about the substantial amendment. Um, Essentially, a substantial amendment will occur when any proposed change on an annual action plan consists of any action involving more than $400,000. And so that is what we have on our agenda for tonight. A substantial amendment to the 2019 consolidated plan consists of $2,010,184 in CDBG CARES Act CV3 funding, which will be reallocated to the Family Housing Advisory Services for an Emergency Rental Assistance Program. And so this is a project or program that will replace a program that had previously been awarded to match. So it's the same activity, but a different organization. Um, and we also would like to clarify that CB3 funds uh, were reserved for emergency rental assistance. So that's why we see um, the same activity. And then a five day public comment period on this amendment began today and will end on March 21st. So that is what we have on the substantial amendment. Believe the next slide allows for questions. Um, I will say if you would like to provide feedback, there will be information about how to do that um, at the end of the presentation as well. Do you have any questions? How many people do you have on Facebook? There was like four. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Take some time. <clears throat> There's always a 15 second delay on Facebook. Nothing yet. We can come back to it if there are any questions. Thank you, Alyssa. Our next topic is the citizen participation plan. So what is a citizen participation plan? We call it the CPP for shortening. Um, the CPP lays out the minimum standards of community engagement that the city will undertake as we develop our goals, set our spending plans, um, and provide documents for review and comment. So it's the minimum. It's not everything that we will do. There is a security guard on a segue, and I'm sorry, it was very distracting. Um, the development of the CPP is required by HUD, and there is a set of regulations around it, which Marcus has put in, is going to put in the chat, the regulations, as well as a link to our draft documents. Um, so you can read up on what's required of the CP, in the CPP. It's written by us and we submit it to HUD. We occasionally review the plan and make changes as we find the need to, has arisen. The last time that the plan was amended was in 2020 and the last major update to it was in 2018. Next slide. So what are we changing? There are two primary changes that we're making in this update. 
These are that we are adding more flexibility when we'll have virtual only public meetings, and that we're adding a commitment to always have, again, at a minimum, interpreters for ASL and Spanish at all of our public meetings. There's some other changes that you may notice if you compare the documents side by side. However, these are strictly formatting and editing. Um, they don't change what we're requiring ourselves to do. In the draft amendment, amended CPP that is on our website, the significant changes in policy are highlighted in blue. We're adding the changes to flexibility to the flexibility to hold virtual public meetings because during the pandemic, HUD provided waivers to allow for virtual only public meetings. Normally we would do meetings in person. Um, however, that waiver expired in the fall. And then when we went to hold our January meeting, there was some gray area around if we were allowed to continue holding only virtual public meetings. We found out that, um, or HUD gave us the okay, but said that we needed to update our CPP as soon as possible. And this is our first chance to do that. So the wording to the change for virtual only meetings reads as such. Whenever possible, meetings and hearings will be held in person. When circumstances require, say for public health, safety, et cetera, and as determined by the planning director, a virtual public hearing may take place in, per, in place of the in-person meeting. A virtual public hearing may also um, be held in addition to an in-person meeting. We recognize that not everyone wants to or can attend an in-person meeting and that not everyone has the ability to attend a virtual only meeting. So by trying to provide both, we're working to increase accessibility to the information that we provide. Um, <clears throat> the other way that we're increasing that accessibility <coughs> is by assuring that we have ASL interpreters and Spanish language interpreters. Today, you'll note that we have four language interpreters and we made the decision on those interpreters based on data that we received from the Omaha Public Schools about the languages that are most common in the district. So keep in mind that when I'm speaking slowly or pausing frequently, it's so that our translators can keep up and we can be a more inclusive, accessible department. Next slide. Do you have any questions on the citizen participation plan? All right, let's move forward. We're coming to the CAPER. The CAPER or Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report is our annual reporting to HUD and to the community. We're talking about the actions that we took in the previous program year of 2021. The CAPER is due to HUD 90 days at the, after the end of our program year, which for the city of Omaha is January 1 to December 31. So our CAPER is due on March 30th every year. The CAPER is divided up into sections such as resources and investments, demographics of those assisted, public housing, and homelessness. The very first section, CRO5, is kind of like an executive summary. And so if you're only going to read one section, that gives the bones of what we do. While it's primarily focused on how we use our entitlement funds, CDBG, home and ESG. It also has discussions on other activities that we undertake, such as the lead hazard remediation program and how we work with agencies addressing the same types of issues that we do, 
such as the Omaha Housing Authority and the Metropolitan Area Continuum of Care for the Homeless, MATCH. The caper that you see on our website is the format used by HUD. We recognize that it maybe is not the most reader-friendly document, but that's something that they created for us. Slide. Priority goals and needs are established in the five-year consolidated plan. The current consolidated plan was for the period of 2019 to 2023. These priority needs were established through the public meetings, focus groups, and consultations that were held during the development of the plan. So every project or program that we fund in a given program year should be working towards one of the needs that we have listed. In this plan, the priority needs are non-housing community development, which we used to call neighborhood revitalization, affordable housing, homelessness, non-homeless supportive housing, economic development, fair housing, and community resilience. The first six were all identified as high priority, while the last, community resilience, was identified as a low priority. Okay. The goals developed in the action plan are the measurable ways that we work towards addressing the priority needs. So every project or program that we fund must have goals to reach in one of these categories. That may be the number of commercial buildings improved through the facade improvement program, the number of people who received financing for the purchase of a home through the home buyer financing program, or the number of people impacted by an infrastructure project. Yeah. Oh. The definition of community resilience. Yeah, community resilience, um, really focuses around um, what happens when something goes wrong. So if when we have flooding and people are displaced from their homes, do we have a plan for that? When our climate is changing and we have more very hot days, um, we need to plan for that. So com community resilience is, is what happens when things go wrong. Um, we do work with the Douglas County disaster relief um, folks. And so that's part of the development is a community disaster relief pro, uh, plan. All right, next slide. In 2021, the city made available a total of approximately $11.3 million and spent a total of approximately $10.7 million. This is a good opportunity to talk about the difference between the amounts in our action plan and the corresponding caper. So when you were at our January meeting, we put forward the amount of money that we had for the year and how we were going to um, allocate that to different programs. When you go back to the CAPER this year, what you're seeing is not all of the programs that we funded in the previous program year. What you're seeing is what was completed in the previous program year. So we may have started construction on a home in 2019, but then that home didn't sell until 2021. So while 2019 funds would have been used in the construction of that home, it wouldn't have been reported on the CAPER until 2021. So every year we award all of the funds that we use or that were allocated, but the spending may look different when you look at the CAPER. It, is confusing to us and we look at it all the time. So if you have questions, feel free to ask them. We 
go down. Sorry. So this image depicts the locations of projects completed in 2021 utilizing only CDBG and home funds. The ESG is not on this map. Um, this map utilizes qualified census tracts, which is what you see in green. And those are census tracts that at least half of the households have an income less than 60% of the area median income. And I'm sorry, I meant to get that number for you, but it does depend on household size. Um, and so it basically means that there's a high concentration of low and very low income households in those green census tracts. The blue dots then represent projects assisted with CDBG or home funds. And the orange is an outline of the NRSAs or Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Areas. Qualified census tracts are similar, but not exact to the measurement that we use to determine if we are um, concentrating our assistance in areas that HUD might prefer, but it's not quite the same. However, the data that we were using um, that HUD has provided is quite old, and this is more up to date. We have several designations that we use to define program boundaries. These include citywide programs, the Council Bluffs Consortia area, uh, which we'll have more on in a second, the area east of 72nd Street, the North Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Area, and then the South Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Area. In 2021, approximately 38% of our funding was spent in the North NRSA and 6% in the South. Part of this is because our current focus on the Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grant, which is focused on the Highlander neighborhood on North 30th Street, uh, is our primary focus. The city has received a planning grant and applied for another implementation grant for an area in the South NRSA. So over the next couple of years, some of that focus is likely to shift south. Now for consortias. We are in what is called a consortia with Council Bluffs. By forming a consortia, neighboring units of local government can take a more regional approach to addressing housing issues and allows a community that is not large enough to receive home funding on its own to utilize some of those funds. So we share just our home funds with Council Bluffs. They're eligible for approximately 10% of our consortia's home funds on a regular basis. And if you would like to learn more about what a home consortia is, Marcus is going to has, or Wyatt has dropped a link in the chat for you, someone has. Now, a Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Area, NRSA, is a CDBG grantee designated area that is targeted for revitalization. An NRSA is different from other local targeted areas in that the designation is reviewed and approved by HUD. In return for the designation, grantees are uh, then afforded enhanced flexibility in undertaking some economic development, housing, and public service activities with their CDBG funds. You can learn more about NRSAs and the benefits of doing a project in the NRSA uh, at a link that I did not include on Marcus's spreadsheet. <laughs> so uh, we will send that out in the meeting tomorrow. Yeah. Or in the email. Oh, why it's typing it in place.
PDF. All right, I think this is right. All right, there we go. Oh, you only sent it to one person. Oh. <laughs> Rosie, I hope you're really interested in. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, well, it's we're having a, a technical glitch, far fewer. So uh, let's, we'll just move on and. and... This image shows how funds were dispersed by city council district. As the dots on the previous slide indicate, most funds were invested in District 2, which encompasses more, most of North Omaha. Go on to the next slide, Lindsay. Sorry, thank you. Okay, people served. In 2021, CDBG programs served a total of 1,075 individuals or households. These programs included the Omaha 100 Mortgage Program, Home Buyer Education from Family Housing Advisory Services, our Owner Occupied Rehabilitation Programs, and Job Training Programs from Step Up and the Latino Center for the Midlands. The photograph shown here is a property that went through our program providing new roofs to low income seniors. The CDBG Public Improvements Project was a street improvement project on Corby Street. The impact for a street improvement project is measured by the number of people who live within a certain distance of the project. So that project accounted for 3,190 people who were impacted. Additionally, the city receives funding from HUD to address lead-based paint hazards inside of homes. This program, not listed on this slide, served a total of 34 low and moderate income households in 2021. The CDBG code enforcement program responded to a total of 362 code violation cases and made a total of 1,864 visits to address those code violations. The code enforcement officer is focused in the North NRSA so that we can target the area of town that is both lowest income and has um, the highest concentration of code enforcement violations. Three programs funded with, CD, with CDBG CV were completed in 2021. These were a program from the Nebraska Enterprise Fund assisting micro enterprises, a program from the um, North End Teleservices that provided 40 jobs. We'll hear from them in a little bit. And a COVID testing program located at One World Health Center. The program served the bulk, or this program served the bulk of the people in CDBG CV and tested more than 6,000 people for COVID at its stockyards facility. Home funded programs included home buyer, rental rehabilitation programs, and the tenant-based rental assistance operated by the Omaha Housing Authority. For ESG, Shelters were awarded with operations funding and provided shelter to 3,220 individuals for more than 150,000 bed nights of shelter. Rapid rehousing providers served 26 families and 27 individuals. I don't know how you do it. So I hope we can power through. Next slide.
demographics. This chart shows the proportions of um, racial identities that were served by all regular CDBG home and ESG programs. Uh, so we do keep track of that. And I hope that this chart makes sense. Um, in addition to this, approximately 10% of program participants identified as Hispanic. This does not include the ESG CV funded projects. <coughs> Next slide. Alyssa is really involved with the women and minority owned businesses. And so she's going to talk about this. So what we have on, oh, I think we lost it, but I, I'll kind of go over a little bit what was shown on the screen. Um, just to highlight the caper requires that we report on the home program activities on how many women and minority owned businesses were contracted or owned properties invested in as well as how much funding was involved in those contracts. Um, so because of this, we can note that the, the information and the graphics showed here pertain to the home program, um, but I will provide some additional data about our CDBG construction contracts as part of this presentation as well. Um, so for home specifically, we had 10 general contracts that were awarded. And those general contractors had subcontractor agreements with 110 uh, businesses. And of that 110, this included two minority owned businesses and 18 women owned businesses. So of the 8,292,871 awarded, $230,180 represented MBE contracts and $1,316,202 represented women owned business enterprises. So then the CDBG program as a comparison had 113 contractors. Um, so, and we did see a higher participation in the CDBG program of MBE and WBE contractors. And from those contracts, 28 or nearly 25% were MBE and 19 or approximately 17% were WBE. And of the MBE contracts, 10 were Black or African American one was Native American and 17 was Hispanic American. So we do, like I said, have a little bit more participation on the CDBG side in this last year. And that we don't have data available on the number of MBE, WBE contractors who bid on construction projects, um, but I do want to provide a little bit more information about the outreach that we've done to encourage more participation. Uh, our staff work with REACH and the SEB program to hold technical assistance trainings throughout the year, um, just to provide additional information on a number of different topics, such as how to bid on projects, Davis-Bacon compliance, Section 3 compliance, and other business certifications and uh, contractor licensing as well. REACH whole or sponsors the REACH Construction Industry Certificate Program, which is a 10-week program designed to help uh, small businesses kind of get started in the construction field. Uh, the planning department also provides, uh, the planning department does provide, uh, excuse me, the, so just kind of a highlight, to highlight some of the activities that 
some of the training that we have done, we've got some different outreach that we've engaged in. Um, and if anybody has any further suggestions about how we expand our outreach activities or how we better reach out to MBE and WB businesses, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we think we'll have some questions or the chat will be available as well. And I will uh, go ahead and add my email address into the chat as well, just to make sure that you have my information and can reach out to me if you have any questions. So with that, I believe that the next slide allows us to go into some questions. So if you have questions about MBE, WBE, or any of the other topics that Nicole covered, um, now would be a good opportunity to share those questions. <clears throat> All right, we will move on. Next, I want to highlight a few of the specific uh, priority needs and some of the projects that have been completed in those categories. So economic development is, of course, one of the top priorities that we hear anytime we ask what your priorities are. Um, in 2021, there were four programs funded that were working towards that addressing that need. The first two were the job training programs for youth and young adults that are offered by the Empowerment Network and the Latino Center for the Midlands. Last year, these programs combined served 186 people. The other two programs were funded with CDBG-CV, which is CDBG funding that came through the CARES Act. We also received ESG CV and all CV funds are required to work towards preventing, preparing for, and responding to COVID. So the first was the Nebraska Enterprise Fund, which assisted micro businesses. They assisted 45 businesses in shifting their business strategies to be better prepared to handle the challenges brought on by COVID-19. So that might be getting a better website set up for online sales, or um, honestly, that's, that's the best example I have. The other project that was funded was the North End Teleservices. Um, will you please make Haley an, a panelist and invite her to unmute? So CDBG funding, was provided and helped with um, the retention of 40 jobs. So, okay, Haley Plain is here from North End Teleservices to talk about what the CDBG funding allowed them to do. Hi everyone, um, my name is Haley Plain. Um, and I am the Director of Customer Experience here at North End Teleservices. Um, I do have a camera. I'm not sure if it needs to be turned on or not, but either way. Um, it's my honor to talk to you all today and share how the CDBG grant has allowed us to not only grow as a business, but put time back into our people to continue living our mission every day. We received CDBG grant money for job creation and retention in Northeast Omaha to continue fulfilling our mission of creating jobs and changing lives. We have met and exceeded our goal of new positions created. With this increase in jobs in the North Omaha, Northeast Omaha community, we have also created an estimated economic impact of $168 million to date. More than a third of our employees live within three miles of our location at 1500 North 24th Street. These funds have not only helped us to create jobs and retain them, but we have also leveraged them to enhance our career pathing and skills training for our employees. In September of 2021, we launched a Customer Experience Academy cohort project 
in partnership with Metropolitan Community College. Five members of our leadership team will graduate from MCC with a customer experience career certificate and will be ready and prepared to take the National Customer Service Association examination to obtain their Certified Customer Service Professional Certification, or CCSP, this May. 60% of these participants are first-generation college students, myself included. A fearless member of our team with a strong pull to her, towards her cultural background is one of our first-generation graduates and a student within the cohort. She says that she's breaking generational chains. The first chain that Reggie broke was graduating high school as a lot of her family dropped out in the eighth grade. She is determined to set the standard for her two sons and the future generation to come. Now with the opportunity between North End and MCC, she will continue to set the standard for her family, continue to break those chains, and lead her bloodline into generational wealth. Reggie says, I am honored to be the chosen one to make that change in my family. Another one of our employees, Laura, took the cohort opportunity without batting an eye. Having this opportunity has given her a chance to correct a mistake she made many years ago when she dropped out of college and one that I can personally relate to myself. She says, that has always been the biggest regret of my life. Well, I got the chance to fix that mistake by participating in this cohort program, and it has made me feel so good about myself. I feel I won't always have the college dropout stigma laying over my head anymore. She was very nervous about going back to school and had very low expectations for herself already thinking she would not complete the program or fail. Laura currently maintains a 4.0 GPA and says this opportunity has already changed my life. I can already tell it's made me more confident in myself. It has made me love myself more. And for someone who has suffered some damaging things in life, it is a really good feeling to be so proud of myself and know that I'm no longer a college dropout. Financial health is ranked as our number one employee barrier. We continue to provide financial literacy training to all of our employees through our own training, as well as with our Grow Navigator to teach the basics of budgets and achieve goals of increasing credit scores and buying first homes. One of our own was struggling, not just with finances, but also with the absorbed responsibility of being the oldest in his generation, the caregiver to his family and the breadwinner. His salary was good, but his expenses outweighed his income in every direction. Our navigator helped him to put together a budget and guided him through some finance making decisions that made the budget actionable such as avoiding payday loans. Our navigator helped him navigate other personal struggles as well, such as dealing with family and his health as a transplant recipient. Our navigator has connected him to various resources and is currently helping him to find the right therapist that is a lot more like him, black, LGBTQ, male, and so on. Since Rodney started going to the Navigator, he has been able to go full force in starting his own business. When his family now calls him to settle situations, he's so much more confident with asking them to call another member of the family without feeling guilty. He has been able to pay off debts. And all in all, he says, my sessions with the Navigator have been impactful for me. And I'd encourage any employee to seek her assistance if you feel like the sky is falling down on you. North End's leadership and development career pathing has soared over the past year thanks to this grant. 
We have created our own North End Teleservices University and have 30 plus leadership topics that our employees can take to enhance their careers and learn a variety of skills. Navigating through tough situations, leadership skills, excelling in their careers, communication and planning skills, overcoming stress, and how to lead a team are only the tip of the iceberg. We are also proud of our Frontline Supervisor Apprenticeship Program that was created with the US Department of Labor. We have five apprentices starting on their journey this year in 2022, and three graduated in 2021 for a total of eight, which has exceeded our goal of three graduates with this grant. North End Teleservices is beyond grateful for the support of our community and for the city's planning support of North Omaha. We are excited for all that is ahead of us thanks to the growth, growth we experienced as a result of these funds. As a community, county, state, and nation, we are all better together. And this grant money has allowed North End as well as several others to accomplish so much. We invite you to stay connected to all that North End Teleservices is up to by visiting our webpage at www.northendteleservices.com, liking us on Facebook and following us on LinkedIn. We love collaboration and we love our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haley. Thank you so much, Haley. Okay, next slide, please, Wyatt. So I want to quickly touch on the accomplishments working towards our goal of providing and helping to maintain affordable our affordable housing stock. We completed 635 owner-occupied rehabilitation projects in 2021. 525 of those were either emergency repair or handyman which are smaller projects that we provide to low-income seniors. So that's always the biggest chunk of those projects. It also included 29 healthy homes projects, three barrier removal projects, 19 exterior rehabilitation projects, and nine new robes for seniors. Um, six single family, whoop, six new single family homes were rehabilitated in rental units. Six new apartments were constructed. Four new single family homes were completed in the building and sale process. And there were 63 housing placements. Housing placements come from the tenant-based rental assistance program and through rapid rehousing that is um, operated by Together and Heartland Family Service. And that's with ESG, whereas tenant-based rental assistance is home funds. Next up, we have non-housing community development or neighborhood revitalization. So three main projects were completed in 2021. Um, they were public infrastructure improvements at Corby Street, which is what you see to the left there. That's the new street and new sidewalks. We often do those projects in areas where there's more housing development with our nonprofit partners. Um, and that helps it be a little bit easier, a little bit lower barrier for those folks to do their work of constructing housing. The other two projects completed in 2021 were facade improvements at the Goodwins Spencer Street Barbershop and at the Carnation Ballroom. So this is the Goodwins Spencer Street Barbershop. It's an iconic site. In North, on the North 24th Street corridor. And last year, the city was able to support the facade improvements. It 
really is an amazing transformation. So Lavanya Goodwin is here to tell us about how the funding helped them and what the impact on the North 24th Street corridor might look like. Good evening, everyone. Uh, like Nicole said, my name is Lavanya Goodwin, and thank you, Nicole, and the City Planning Department for having us this evening. Um, I'm here along with my husband, Dan, and our developer, Ben Swan, to really just talk about um, this overall project and how beneficial it was not only to rehabbing our building, but I believe um, you know, sparking a chain reaction of revitalization on North 24th Street. Um, first of all, um, I if Dan could unmute it, I think if Dan could be unmuted, I think it's worthy for him to talk about the history of the building, which will give some context to why um, it was so important to preserve it. I am unmuted at this time. Can everyone hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hi. And so, as my wife talked about the history of Goodwin Spencer Street Barbershop, my father, uh, who's now 90 years old, um, opened Goodwin Spencer Street Barbershop uh, on that same block a little bit further to the north, uh, which was actually 3122 on 24th Street in 1955. Um, the significance of him opening the shop at that spot was it was actually a you know a barrier he broke a barrier most black businesses did not exist that far north on north 24th street and so goodwin spencer street barbershop went on to become a strong community hub on so many levels uh, some of the history that took place there in 1966 uh, Oscar nominated documentary uh, on race relations was shot there, um, A Time for Burning. Uh, Senator Chambers, the, the longest running uh, senator in uh, history, was also, also um, uh, became his headquarters uh, for uh, his run for the, uh, for the unicameral. And, so many other things. Uh, it was, it became uh, a place where people could go for all types of assistance, help, advice, and information. And so in 2015, um, I took over ownership of the shop, recognizing that the building structure itself did need to be renovated. My father had done a lot of things in the years prior and yet there was the need for that assistance to be able to do what actually needed to be done to the building. And so you can see from the photos that were provided, uh, there has been a tremendous transformation. We're still doing more. And, uh, we anticipate uh, being able to reopen to the community at some point in time. I'm understanding that um, it, I'm sounding muffled and I don't know if my uh, headset is good. Can, can everyone hear or understand what I'm stating? Yes. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the barbershop in and of itself, and just that I felt it was very important that North 24th Street uh, to maintain the buildings and the legacy and to take the buildings forward that help to tell the story of the people that not only lived there, established businesses there, fought for civil rights there, being able to, to see the structures um, and have them maintained is extremely important. And also that it, it's a great example of people in the community uh, still owning, Blacks still owning businesses. And so the CBDG funds uh, enabled us to be able to do that. When we had already started doing some work um, when we went forward and discovered that 
we needed a lot more. So it, it really uh, was very important in, in order for us to be able to move to the, the place we are now. Thank you, Dan. Um, if we could um, go back to the comparison slides, please, um, because this, I wanna just walk you through exactly what um, the building uh, project entailed. Um, as my husband mentioned, um, it was a very, um, you know, rigorous process that we started even prior to uh, approaching the city uh, for the CBDG project funds, and they contributed a, those funds contributed a substantial amount to this project, primarily due to the issue of redlining. Um, and that's because although we were definitely bankable and even did bring uh, funding to the table, the area was so disinvested that there were not a lot of comps that we could actually utilize to refinance um, the building and therefore borrow against um, you know the building to do updates uh, on it and so um, it was really critical um, to to receive the CBDG funding because uh, it really did bridge the gap in a in a very tremendous way um, now I want to talk a little bit about the application process Process because it was very rigorous um, because we were were new to projects of this scope. Although we had my husband and I had managed and owned um, some some rental properties, this was a a larger um, overall project that we had taken on before. Um, and therefore, not only did we engage uh, an initial architect that did some of the um, existing building renderings. Uh, we also did had some um, architectural engineering work done to determine the soundness of the building. And then, of course, had to come to the table with a project plan, uh, which we work collaboratively with, collaboratively with um, our developer, Ben Swan. This was primarily a, or entirely really, a facade improvement project. Uh, what does that mean? We really define that as the outer shell of the building. And so when you compare the old building uh, versus the new, there are several uh, distinctive differences. One, you'll see the top dormer um, on top of the older building. That was really a, you know, um, a fix uh, that my father-in-law had done. Um, but was not a part of the original building. And so uh, it was necessary to um, replace the, the roof in order to mitigate water and moisture coming in that was affecting the bricks and the overall, um, you know, lifespan and health of the building. Uh, tuck pointing and masonry uh, was also a substantial uh, part of uh, this project. Um, I did submit a slide that showed how some of the brick work needed um, rehab. Uh, let's see if he's going to go to that. Yeah. So you can see up front here, and this was actually a um, just an example of the front facade, how um, there needed to be repair. Um, also windows. This allowed us to replace windows um, and and put in not only windows, but also doors to not only to secure the uh, building uh, from weathering, but also to secure it just from a safety and security perspective. There was some interior work done, but only if it pertained to the exterior. So that means that any work that was um, accomplished, for instance, for the roof, that intersected with the interior of the building that was a part of the project plan. Um, and then we also discovered um, that the back wall, if we go back to that picture, you'll see that the back wall had to be entirely replaced. And that was probably one of the most critical finds. Um, okay, I don't show it here, sorry. But um, 
critical finds in the discovery of um, the building because the back wall, there we go, was literally, um, you could run a pencil through some of the tuck pointing. Um, so it was just really um, a miracle um, that we got to it when we did because it also did that, that type of deterioration of the building did not uh, show up in our initial architectural um, inspection and or um, engineering, um, you know, work we had done uh, prior to the, um, you know, actually starting the project. So I think that one of the things this building does, among other things, is it shows that, you know, everyday people can put their hands to revitalization in their community and that um, buildings in our community uh, are worth saving. And I, you, everyone knows that when your built environment is beautified and kept up, um, it, it lifts your spirits, it, it lifts your uh, community pride and your overall perception of, of where you live. And so um, this project um, is something that um, we take a lot of pride in and um, it's really just the first phase. I know many people have asked what's the next step for the building. Well, um, my father-in-law who had cut hair for over 65 years um, when COVID hit and the health uh, directive was that you know, barbershops and other entities needed to close. It was a good time for him to transition. And so um, we are currently considering, you know, what the next phase of the building will be. Uh, but we just really closed this project out in October. So um, we're currently just, you know, again, diligently considering our options for how we move forward with this building. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lavanya. I drove by this afternoon and it really is a night and day transformation. It looks so good. No, it's really a point of pride. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks to Ben Swan, who was a partner in this project with us and really as the developer, along with my husband oversaw um, the day-to-day -day operations of um, the work on this building. And again, it's no small task to um, take on a project like this. We learned a lot and um, just excited to see the, the level of um, revitalization that is happening on North 24th Street. We've got some other exciting announcements that aren't necessarily geared toward this meeting, uh, but we're moving right along on North 24th Street. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed that when I drove up the street today. It, there's a lot of activity going on, positive activity. Next slide, please. Next up, we will have Ben Swan uh, to talk about his building, the Carnation Ballroom, which is just a couple of blocks from the um, Goodwin Spencer Barbershop. Um, there was a really cool article from the North Omaha History blog. And Marcus, will you please put that link in the chat for us so that if you want to learn more about the history of this building, you can. Um, it's been a ballroom for concerts. It was recent, or most recently, I believe an auto mechanic shop. Um, and Ben's going to tell us about his vision for how it's going to come back to serve the community again. Take it away, Ben. Thank you very much, Ben Swan, president of Swan Development. Uh, good evening, everybody. So the Carnation Ballroom, that building belonged to uh, my stepfather's father. And he actually ran the Roger Criswell garage for, I believe, over 30 years. And as he was aging, and he was dealing with uh, medical expenses and some home accessibility uh, challenges. Um, what we decided to do was basically keep the building in the family to some degree. And uh, I purchased the building from him 
And he had told me, you know, this was the Carnation Ballroom and told me some of the stories of its, its prior life. And I, um, you know, didn't really know the depth of the history of the Carnation Ballroom. Uh, do we have the slide package that I had sent to, to you? Yep, it just didn't get in the most recent incarnation. So we're pulling it up now. Oh, perfect, perfect. So uh, luckily, the Restoration Exchange Organization uh, decided to basically adopt the Carnation Ballroom and they sponsored a historical narrative uh, research project for this. And so what we did is uh, we went to the community, to neighbors, uh, to family members, to people that actually remembered the Carnation Ballroom. Uh, and then um, we just learned so much about the history of the building, who the people that played there were. Um, Roger um, Criswell told me about a um, dance floor that would come up from the basement. And the basement, the, the first floor would open up and the uh, piano and uh, some of the band would come up out of the basement. And we did some research that confirmed that. And then we also got to learn about some other uh, parts of the history of that building. So it, it was actually originally built as the Forbes Bakery in the 1920s. And then, yep, if we go, yep, Forbes Bakery in the 1920s. And then I think a, a big overlooked chapter in this building's life is when it was the AMVETS Club for uh, the North Omaha World War II veterans immediately after World War II. And that was for 10 or 15 years. And we have a lot of great um, historical articles and pictures of the AMVETS Club. Uh, Adam Fletcher Sass, he's done a lot of North Omaha history research as well. And we got some of that from him. Um, and then obviously the most culturally significant, a lot of people are still alive that enjoyed the Carnation Ballroom. Maybe they met their spouse at the Carnation Ballroom in the 1950s. Um, that, that's some of the history. Um, if anybody has any questions about, you know, some of the uh, musical greats that played at the Carnation, James Brown, B.B. King, Fats Domino, it's just incredible. Uh, today, the building is a 6,500 square foot single story building, primarily masonry. There is a lot of uh, heavy steel support inside of it. And then there's some uh, wood joist construction holding up the roof. Uh, if we go to the next slide and we look at some of the walls and, and this actually was what one of Dan and Lavanya's walls, that second story, we, uh, it was so deteriorated. So this wall here, there was actually um, trees growing out of the wall. And maybe they had started in a gutter 50 or 40 or 30 years ago. And then they had taken root in the parapet and they'd worked their way down from the top almost all the way to the bottom. And so when we were pulling these roots apart, pulling these trees out of the wall, um, the grout had essentially turned into soil. So had to completely remove the wall. And then when we got down to the footing and the foundation, uh, the footing was cracked. And so we had to actually redo the foundation in this area. There are numerous other photos, you know, more that, than, you know, time would allow where we had to replace other walls. Uh, in the north building, which is the larger building, we had a truss system that had to be completely removed and replaced uh, with a new eye joist system. Uh, we were able to put some new commercial doors, some new gutters. So what we really did here is it wasn't so much facade like it was the Goodwin building. It was that this was a large building with a big history and the funding that was available, uh, which we're extremely grateful for, you know, the building's not yet able to be placed into service as a retail building, but it is gonna be preserved for 50 to 100 more years because all the structural repairs to make it a sound waterproof building have been done. Um, and we were able to do a lot of compaction and grading on the inside. So it's basically like a, a shell that is protected and preserved. This was really about preservation of a historic building. If we go to the next slide. So that is the condition of the interior. Now it is clean um, when it rains, it's dry inside and it's, it's ready for the future. 
we are working with uh, a nonprofit and a couple of other uh, organizations to help a user to occupy this space. Um, I, you know, this is this building here and what I'm willing to do for it is it's a labor of love, you know, and a, and a part of our, you know, family history and for the community. And so we're looking for the best user and we do have a, another significant funding stage that would be required in order to have uh, air conditioning, HVAC, new sewer, uh, new water supply, new electrical, new natural gas throughout the building, bathroom, restrooms, you know, and all the things that would be required to, uh, you know, put it back into use as something that community members could come and go from and enjoy maybe a retail or a services. So it, it's been an honor to be a part of the project so far. And we are looking to work with the community to find a user that can, you know, service the North Omaha community, which, uh, you know, our family, we, we live in Bemis Park, which is part of the new North community. So we're looking forward to this building being a part of, of our community going forward. And we're, we're thankful for HUD funds and CDBG funds, along with our match dollars, uh, to restore, to, to preserve the building and to do structural repairs. And that's, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Um, our next slide is a question slide. So if you have questions, now's the time. Because we're about at the end. All right, seeing none. So we have two announcements. Coming up in May, we will have a whirlwind of community engagement with lots of opportunities for us to tell you, or for you to tell us about your housing needs and wants. Um, this is the development of the Omaha Housing Affordability Action Plan. And it will encompass the development of both our next um, consolidated plan for 2024 to 2029, as well as an update to the affirmatively furthering fair housing plan that we worked on in 2017 and 2018. And then it will also uh, develop the city's submittal in response to LB 866, which was passed through the state legislature last year. The bill requires Omaha to adopt an affordable housing plan um, and I see that Marcus has put in the chat the link to for you to be able to read the text of the statute. So if you want to know more and you want to know what is required of us, it's right there. Um, we have to submit that before the beginning of 2023. So be on the lookout for social media announcements and emails from us about all of the engagement that we'll be doing in May. We'll have at least one open house in every council district. So next slide. The next announcement is that 2023 CDBG and home applications are due April 8th. And Marcus, I believe that you have links. There we go for um, learning more about that process and to see the application. Marcus just put the link in the chat for us. So if you have questions <coughs> after you view that material, you can email Pat Evans. She loves it when I put her email address into the world. And finally, we really want your feedback. So there are three ways that you can comment on the documents today the substantial amendment to the 2019 consolidated plan, moving ESG, C, or sorry, CDBG CV3 funds from match to FAS or rental assistance still, the changes to the citizen participation plan, and of course the CAPER. You can do that by filling out our feedback form. The link is there and Marcus has also put it into the chat for us. Um, there's only one required question the rest are optional. 
You can email us at hcdcomments at cityofomaha.org, or you can call us at 402-444-5150. We will publish a summary of comments on our website after the comments close, and maybe as we go. Um, and remember, importantly, that comments on all of those documents closes March 30 or 21st. And then we will have to submit it to HUD by the 30th. So um, that gives us some time to respond to your comments and your questions. And hopefully we'll hear from you. So I'll give you a few more minutes, moments to ask any last minute questions or give any comments. And then we will um, see you next time. Uh, Wyatt is putting in the chat for us the link to our website which is where you can, again, find all three of those documents, links to them to review. Um, and we will send out a follow-up email tomorrow that includes links to those documents and our feedback form. And of course, the recording of this webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, Linda Toomey says that the slide link goes to an error message and doesn't give the presentation. Linda, I will fix that and include the link tomorrow uh, in the email. Oh wait, the slide link to the bit.ly? I'll send it tomorrow, either way. It worked for me earlier today. Okay, it worked for me earlier today, so that is frustrating. All right, we'll see you all later.